Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about in Article 110 is 110.26, Spaces About Electrical Equipment. Now, this is a big, big deal. Uh, I always get asked every three years, Ryan, what's the, what's the biggest change in the code? And it's like, well, it depends on what you do. You know, if you do residential, your answer is going to be different than somebody that does industrial. And if you do commercial, you're going to have a different answer than somebody that does limited energy. So it depends, you know, I and mean, what's the biggest change in the code? I don't know. Depends on what you're doing. But I'll tell you right now, one of the biggest changes in the 2020 code, and it certainly could be the biggest change, depending on what you do, is they made some changes to 110.26, which were revised and clarified in the 2023, but also expanded in the 2023. And, and that is the rules for egress obstruction. This is a big deal. Listen, if you're a designer, you need to pay attention to this section because this one's a big one. The limited access allowances were refined. Equipment above suspended ceilings is what we're mainly talking about there. Uh, the working space must now be flat, which we'll talk about. And service equipment now requires dedicated electrical space being below it and above it, which we'll talk about. Uh, we also made some similar changes to medium voltage uh, in 110.34, so I'm certainly not going to cover the same thing twice, but just know that, you know, 110.26 got changed, so did 110.34. Let's take a look. 110.26 starts with a general statement that says working space and <clears throat> access to and egress from it are required around all the electrical equipment to allow safe operation and maintenance. Look, you have to be able to safely maintain and safely operate all equipment. Now, the definition of equipment is not just transformers and switch gear and switchboards. The word equipment is everything. Everything we install is either a conductor or equipment. Those are the two things that we install. We install conductors, we install equipment. All right, so unless you're pulling wire, you're installing equipment. You have to be able to maintain the receptacle safely. You have to be able to operate the receptacle safely. You have to be able to maintain this conduit fitting safely. Now, what's the maintenance on a conduit fitting? There is none. So you can conceal it in the wall. What's the maintenance on a receptacle? I don't think there's any. Do you have to operate a receptacle? Sure. Now, does that mean you need three feet in front of it? No, I didn't say you did. This is talking about while well, it's de-energized. Everything has to have enough space that you can get to it and get away from it and operate it and maintain it safely. All right? Now, if it's likely that you're going to be doing those things while the equipment is energized, then I read 110.26a. All right? So 110.26 is a general statement that applies to everything. We added this language. We actually moved it from 110.26c over here to 110.22 and or well, 110.26, excuse me. Uh, and it says open equipment doors must not impede access to or egress from the working space. All right. Now, on paper, this is a very good change. And there are certainly instances where this is a very good change and a very important change. Uh, look at the picture here. This is one of those pieces of equipment, uh, a freestanding switchboard, right, where it's like uh, you, you've got the doors that open, right, you pull the thing, the levers down, and you open them up 90 degrees, and usually the little pins drop on the bottom, right, and lock them in place, so it's, uh, you know, 90 degrees from, the, from their starting position. Now, what if I had something like a transformer right in front of that equipment? I mean, because here's the thing, man, shut those doors and measure that, you comply. You have four feet between the front of that switchboard and the transformer. That complies. When those doors are open and those little pins drop down, you will have, you got nowhere to run. If anything bad were to happen, even if you have PPE on, if anything bad was to happen, you are not escaping. All right, because you'd have to try to squeeze through that little six inch opening between the doors and the transformer, it ain't gonna happen, okay? So, on paper, this is a really, really good safety requirement, all right? But, it's also very vague, it's open. Must not impede access to or egress from the working space. Now, before, that's all it said. And it was like, okay, wait a minute, what does that mean? 
you, you give me a number at least, right? I mean, how, how much space do I need? Well, now in the 2023 in the 2023 code, it says access or egress is considered impeded if one or more open equipment doors reduces access to an egress from the working space to less than 24 inches wide and six and a half feet high. All right, cool. At least we have a number. All right, so don't just tell me, hey, don't don't uh, don't cause an obstruction or don't don't cause an impediment to egress. You have to tell me what that means. So they did. Now, look, in the picture, you can see this little concrete pad down here. I know that would not comply under the 2020 code, but look, this building here was it's older than that. So let's forget about the concrete pad for a minute. With both of those, those, with both of those doors open, and, and if you read it, it does say one or more open equipment doors. So you have to measure this with both doors open. I need to have at least two feet between those. So in this installation, those things would have to be two feet farther apart at a minimum in order to comply. Let's look at another example. If I have open doors on either of those two pieces of equipment, then I've got a problem. If both of them are open, you need to have 24 inches between the doors. Now, look, I'm just going to tell you my opinion on this. Uh, at a lot of the facilities where this is going to be a problem, you have documented safety requirements. You would never be allowed to work energized on two pieces of equipment that are facing each other. There, was, If somebody saw you doing that, you would be fired and down the road and for good reason. All right, so I still think we need some relief in this section for supervised industrial locations because here's the thing. You might be looking at this and saying, oh, hey, it's easy. So you need two more feet. Big deal. <laughs> yeah, big deal. There are eight of these rows of switch gear. All right, there's eight of these. This room would have to be 20 feet bigger in order to comply with this rule. That is a big deal. All right, that is a major deal. So this rule, at least we have some clarification that the, the access that we need between them is 24 inches. Before, we just didn't even say, right? But now we do have some guidance. I still think that this rule, it's great on paper. Uh, in practice, still have some work to be done in my opinion, but there's no question it increases safety. Uh, but does it do it, you know, at, at the cost of making a building, you know, significantly bigger? I don't know. 110.26a, working space for equipment up to 1,000 volts to ground must comply with A1 through A4 if it's likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized. All right, so examination while energized includes measuring voltage. All right, and I think that's probably the thing that we do more than anything else while the equipment is energized. It, it, it should be, because that's something that we have to do while it's energized, right? In NFPA 70E in an OSHA, we recognize that equipment sometimes has to be worked on energized, but there's a difference between repair work and diagnostic work, okay? Diagnostic, measuring voltage, you know, that's part of being an electrician. We, we have to troubleshoot. We have to verify things work. But when it comes to repair, we don't need to be in there turning screwdrivers and nut drivers and ratchets and things, all right? That can be worked on while it's off. But the fact of the matter is measuring voltage is something that usually has to be done while it's energized. So if it's likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized, you have to comply with 110.26A1 through A4. I think we're all going to agree panel boards fall under that criteria. In my opinion, in my opinion, most transformers do not. I've never felt compelled to measure voltage in a transformer. I'm going to measure it either on the primary or on the secondary, not in the transformer. So, well, what about maintenance? Well, you do maintenance while it's off. Well, what about infrared testing? Well, when you're taking the cover off that transformer, it should be off while you're removing the cover. Then you can turn it back on then you can do your thermography. And doing thermography is really not an unsafe practice. In 70E, we even recognize that that is not likely to cause an arc flash incident, but taking the cover off is, all right? So, depends on your facility, okay? So if your equipment is likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, maintenance while energized, keep reading. A1 talks about the depth of the working space, A2 talks about the width, A3 talks about the height, A4 talks about working space with limited access. 
if equipment is likely either due to its instructions or by its very function. If it's required to be in a space with limited access, then the following applies. Uh, I always think of equipment above a suspended ceiling when it comes to this. Usually the instructions for equipment usually aren't going to tell you to put it above a suspended ceiling, but the function might. I mean, look, if you've ever worked on a hospital, you know exactly where I'm going. If you're in a hospital, you have tons of stuff in the ceiling because it's a hospital. <laughs> I mean, there, there is equipment everywhere. And you don't want to have the disconnecting means for the equipment down by the patient, right? It has to be within sight. And the equipment's up there, so the disconnect's got to be up there because it's required by its function. So let me ask you a question. How do you get three feet by 30 inches wide in a two by two grid? Well, back in the 2017, they made some clarification. I think it was 2017, maybe 2020. They made some clarifications on how we can do that. It says, look, for equipment above a grid ceiling, the opening has to be at least 22 by 22. For crawl spaces, the opening has to be at least 22 by 30. All right, so that gets you a two by two tile. And for crawl spaces, that's the minimum size allowed in the building code anyway, 22 by 30. B, the width of the working space must be at least 30 inches wide, but no less than the actual width of the equipment. All doors and hinges must be capable of opening a full 90 degrees. All right, cool, so far so good. Item D. The space in front of the equipment must comply with A1, which is the depth. And it has to be unobstructed to the floor by fixed cabinets, walls, or partitions. I don't have a great photograph of this. I, I've seen where this would come up, but I, I just didn't take a picture. So I'm thinking like you're in a, an office environment or, or maybe even a, maybe a doctor's office would be a good example. You've got equipment above the suspended ceiling. What this is saying is, look, you have to be able to put a ladder to get to the equipment. Okay, so yeah, once I'm at the grid ceiling, I've got three feet and 30 inches and all this stuff, but that doesn't help if I can't put a ladder under it. So I need to have clear space down to the floor that's unobstructed by fixed cabinets, walls, or partitions. Good code language there. The required height is whatever is needed to install the equipment. Now here I'm showing a crawl space. Um, now, can I put a panel board down in a space with limited access like this? Well, in existing dwellings, yes. Take a look at the exception in 110.26A3. I think it's exception two. Uh, could I put it in new construction in a commercial building? Uh, probably not, because the only place, look, the only place that you can utilize A4 is if the equipment, by its function or instructions, has to be there. All right, but let's pretend for some reason this has to be there. The required height is whatever is needed to install the equipment. Now D says, and this was revised and I think for good reason, D says ceiling tiles and horizontal ceiling components are allowed in the working space. All right, so here I've got this sprinkler pipe in front of the disconnect, that's a violation. That's, that's in the working space, all right? But if you could remove the sprinkling pipe, just, just do me a favor and ignore it for a second. What we're saying is, look, the ceiling members are okay, but the location of weight-bearing ceiling components must not require more than a six-inch reach to work on the equipment. All right, now I don't know what they call them in your neck of the woods. In my area, we call them mains and tees, right, when it comes to a ceiling grid. The mains are the ones that span all the way across the ceiling, all right? Those would be the weight-bearing components. You're not going to move those as an electrician. They're the mains, right? The tees that snap in, we can move those, right? I can't. I'm too big of a spaz. Every time I took one of those things out, I broke them. So, you know, if you can, more power to you. But what we're saying is, look, the ceiling grid itself can be in the working space because most people can remove the tees and work on them. You're not removing a main. So if a main is in the working space, that's okay as long as I don't have to reach more than six inches across the main. Where did that six inch come? Why not seven? Why not five? Uh, I would guess because of uh, 110.26A3, where it says you can have like a wireway underneath the panel, right? Or a concrete pad under the panel. That's probably where the six inch measurement come, came from. So good work here in 110.26A4. I, I like what they did. <sighs> On paper, I like what they did here. 
110.26A6. Grade floor platform, the working space must be as level and flat as is practical. Okay, it doesn't say it has to be level and flat. All right, it, it can't because if you install equipment on an exterior wall of a building, on the outside of an exterior wall, the grade has to slope away from the building, right, for drainage. So it can't say that the working space must be flat. Uh, but it does say as level and flat as is practical. So we don't want it on a cliff, certainly. I mean, we don't want it on a big old grade. So looking at this picture here on the right, I think we probably have two violations. From the top here, if I, if I measure this, it looks to me like that concrete right there, the supporting structure, sticks out more than six inches in front of the switchboard. I think that's a violation of 110.26A3. Do me a favor, let's just kind of mentally slide that switchboard out so it's level with the concrete, okay? I still think we have a violation of this section because it has to be as level and flat as is practical. I think we need to do a little bit of creative grading around that to get the working space flat. Alright, 110.26c talks about large equipment. Alright, well actually 110.26c talks about act, uh, doors, access and egress. 110.26c2 talks about large equipment. 110.26c3 talks about personnel doors. It says if equipment rated 800 amps or more contains overcurrent devices, switching devices, or control devices, any personnel door that's intended for entrance or exiting to and from the working space must open a full 90 degrees, certainly. I mean, the, I guess the code didn't say that before, so it has to, but yeah, I mean, a door that opens three inches, <laughs> obviously that doesn't help, right? So the door actually has to open at least 90 degrees. And it has to have listed panic or fire exit hardware if it's within 25 feet of the equipment. Um, let's see here. I thought the code said that it has to open in the direction of egress travel. I hope it still says that. My slide does not. I either need to fix the slide or we need to fix the code. So if you're following along, we'll see what uh, we'll see if it's me or if it's them. Let's see. Open from the workspace, open at least 90 degrees, have listed panic for fire exit hardware if it's within 25 feet. So here, this door swings in, which I know at least used to be a violation, and I hope still is. It has levered hardware. That's a violation. Got to have fire or exit hardware. The last thing that changed in 110.26 is in subsection E, dedicated electrical space. Now remember, dedicated space is not where you stand. 110.26A is all about where you, the electrician, are standing. 110.26E is the space that the equipment consumes and directly below it and directly above it. It doesn't go out three feet and 30 inches and all that jazz. Switchboards, switchgear, panel boards, motor control centers, and now service equipment must be provided with dedicated electrical space. All right, so the space above these panels is yours. It's not the plumbers, it's not the HVAC guys. Nobody gets to put stuff there except for you, the electrician, right? Because you're awesome. So that's why you get that space. Because look, if I come to this to this installation as the electrician and the HVAC guy has installed a 24 inch duct right above the panel, well, that doesn't make it unsafe, but it does make it so the panel is pretty much worthless, right? If I can't pipe out of the panel, then there's no point in having a panel. So that's what this rule ensures, is that you have the space to actually do your job. But not everything needs to have conduits and raceways and tubing and cables going to and from it. Think of a, think of a transformer for a second. When's the last time you saw a raceway leaving the top of a transformer? Hopefully never. <laughs> so do I need to have dedicated space above the transformer? Well, no, because I'm not running pipe above the transformer. Right? Dedicated space is where you're going to need the room to install raceways and cables. Okay, so switchboards, got to go out of the top of those, out of the bottom of those. Switch gear, panel boards, and now the service disconnect as well, and motor control centers. Let's take a look at this picture. Previously, nothing in this picture needed to have dedicated electrical space. Now, it still needed working space, right? The space in front of it. But 
Let me ask you a question. This disconnect switch, is that a panel board? Nope. Switch board? No. Switch gear? No. Motor control center? No. Then it didn't need dedicated space below it and above it. Now it does because it's the service equipment. Now remember the service equipment is not just like a, a disconnect so that you can disconnect and work on a piece of equipment. The service equipment is the first place you can shut off the utility to the building, the service. Okay, so service equipment now requires dedicated electrical space. We made it through 110. All right, let's keep going into article 210, which is the next video.